Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Now, this is a project that we've had a lot of requests for, an entertainment center. And this design has plenty of room for the CD player, the VCR, and a TV, plus a storage area down below. Now, it's made out of cherry veneer plywood and solid cherry raised panel doors. That's coming up next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Today we're in Salem, Massachusetts, where the Essex Institute has lovingly preserved several old houses from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, which are also open to the public. Today we're in front of the Crown and Shield Bentley House. There's a couple pieces I want you to see inside. Come on. Ah, the main vestibule. Now, if I remember right, this room over here is the East Parlor. And today it's set up for some formal dining over in this corner. And then over here, it appears that on this old wooden candle stand, everything you need to enjoy the latest Nathaniel Hawthorne novel. Let's go back in the kitchen. Now, this room isn't quite as formal but I'll tell you, it has every gadget and utensil that you need to prepare any kind of meal. And over in this corner, this was the thing that caught my eye the first time in here. What do you suppose it is? Well, if you guessed a baby tender, you're right. Junior sits down in this hoop, and it contains him. He learns how to walk better, and he occupies himself by going around in circles. But this is what I wanted you to see, this simple kitchen cupboard. The thing that I really like about it is that the proportions, especially its width, for its height are just right. I also like this plain cornice detail and the nice opening here at the bottom, which makes it look more like a piece of furniture than a fixed cupboard. I also like the fact that it has two doors. So if you know what you're looking for, you only have to open up part of it. But you know, our entertainment center is something that you're going to put in a bedroom or in your living room, and I want it to be a little bit fancier. So keep in mind all the details we saw here. I'm going to show you something else upstairs. Well, up here on the second level, in one of the bedrooms, is a wonderful example of a desk bookcase. And it has this nice pair of raised panel doors. And they're just about the right proportions for what I'm thinking of. So maybe I can combine the raised panel idea with some of the elements I saw down in the cupboard and come up with our project. Guess I better get to the drawing board. Now, before we begin, I'd like to reassure you that if you'd like to build an exact copy of today's project, that a measured drawing with the materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. I'd also like to take a minute to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read follow and understand all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely will considerably lessen the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. You know, I really like the proportions of that old cabinet. But when it came time to build mine, I had to take some things into consideration that they didn't have. TVs, VCRs, CD players. So I built the cabinet wide enough and deep enough to accept a full-size TV. And I put in some adjustable shelf standards so that I could move the shelves around for the VCR and any other electronic equipment I wanted above. And down below, I built a storage area, again with some adjustable shelves, but this is the area for the things I don't want to see, the tapes, the CDs, and any other equipment. Now, my cabinet has a solid cherry face frame and solid cherry raised panel doors. I made the raised panel doors on the shaper, something I haven't shown you before, but you'll see it today. Now, the rest of the cabinet is cherry veneer plywood. Here's a piece here, 3 quarter inch cherry on the front and on the back, a nice veneer. 
Now, I'd say it's kind of a toss-up as to which side is the best side. Sort of a judgment call. Look it over, and here I've picked this side to be the side I want to see. Now, cutting sheets of plywood like this in a one-man shop is not an easy job. So I've added some accessories to my table saw. An outfeed table, another table over here to my right, and a nice T-square rip fence. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is set my fence to 23 and 7 eighths using my indicator line, the cross here, and my built-in tape measure. But I don't depend on that totally. The rule still holds here. Always measure twice and cut once. So we're OK with that. Now, I've also added a couple rollers out on this end of the table because I'm going to be cutting the two feet off the top of a sheet, the four foot width. And I don't want it to drop down. Now that's the way to cut full sheets of plywood. I've just moved my rollers out in front of the table saw, and I'm going to take this sheet, I'm going to rip it in half. Now I'll adjust the width of the rip to 23 and 5 eighths. Check it, and make the final cut. OK, that takes care of all the plywood cuts. Let's go back to the prototype for a second. The bottom shelf down here, the fixed one, and the middle fixed shelf sit in dados. And the top of the cabinet sits in a rabbit. So I've taken one of the side pieces and set it down on my workbench, laid out the location of the dados and rabbits, clamped down this nice straight edge, and set up my plunge router with a half inch straight cutting bit. And it's as simple as following along the edge of the guide. Well, that takes care of the dado for the middle shelf. And that's the one for the bottom. Now, there's one more dado to cut, and that's for these adjustable shelf standards. They can be mounted right on the surface, but I like to set them in a dado for that nice flush look. Now, to make the dado cut, I've set up my table saw with a twin blade dado cutter. And I've set it up to cut a 5 8 inch wide dado. Now, the back of my cabinet is a piece of quarter-inch veneer plywood, and I've recessed it in. And the reason for that is because when I look at the cabinet from the end, I don't want to see the edge of the plywood. To make the rabbet for that recess, I'm using my router, which is set up with a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit with a little bearing on it to guide it along the edge of the sheet. Well, there's no better time than right now to sand the inner portions of the cabinet. And to do that, I'm just using a fine 150 grit paper. Well, it's assembly time. A little bit of yellow carpenter's glue in that dado joint. And I'll just take my shelf and set it in the joint. Now, if there's any variation at all, I'm going to let it happen at the back of the cabinet. I want the front to be perfectly flush, or else the face frame is going to rock on it later. OK, I don't even have to drive that down. Now I'm just going to slide it out over the end of the bench a bit, tack it with a couple nails using my pneumatic nail gun. 
the back of the cabinet is the quarter inch plywood and I gotta make sure I put the cherry side facing in. Okay, that takes care of that. I'll set this aside and we'll start working on the face frame, which is made out of solid cherry. Now the conventional method of joining face frame parts together might have been a mortise and tenon joint or a shiplap joint. But this method, known as biscuit joinery, is just as strong, it's very accurate, and it's fast. These compressed beechwood biscuits fit into the slot that I just cut. Of course, you'd put some glue on it. And then a corresponding slot in the rail fits over the biscuit. And believe me, this is a very strong joint. Okay, now the idea here is to use a couple clamps to just pull the joint together. You don't want to clamp it so tight that you squeeze all the glue out. Well, I don't even have to wait for the face frame joints to dry. I'll just leave the clamps on it. And as usual, I've applied a little bit of glue to the carcass, the edges of the carcass. And I'll just set it down, get it even and nail it in place with some four-penny finish nails. To finish off the top of the cabinet, I've installed this very simple cornice detail, reminiscent of the one that we saw earlier. Now, it's made out of three-quarter inch stock. It looks thick, but it's the way you cut it. Here's a sample of the piece. The first cut that I want to make is this bevel right here, and that's where it sits against the cabinet. So I've taken my saw and tilted it to 25 degrees and adjusted my rip fence so as to leave about 3 eighths of an inch of material. Now using my sample as a gauge, I have to readjust the rip fence slightly. Just take it away from the blade a little bit. Okay. Now what I want to do is make a 90 degree cut to that first bevel that I made. So I've simply moved the rip fence over the appropriate amount. And one final cut, which is 90 degrees to the second bevel that I made. Now the joiner does a nice job cleaning up any marks left behind by the saw. But there's also another edge to this piece that I'm going to see right here, this flat spot. And I can't really do it on the joiner because there's, there's no way to really hold it secure. I'd have to make a special jig. So to smooth that out, I'm going to use my handheld power plane. Now, before I apply any base molding or that cornice molding, I want to sand the face frame. Now, when I made the face frame, I made it just slightly bigger than the box. That way, there was no doubt that I would cover the edge of the plywood. And now's the time to trim it off using my router, which is set up with a flush cutter. And this little bearing just guides it along the side of the cabinet. Now to make that compound cut, I've set up a jig in my miter box. Just a simple piece of wood clamped down in such a way that it actually holds the piece of molding in the correct orientation. This is still the face side that you're going to see, but I've flipped the molding upside down. This is the bottom edge, and the fence of the miter box is the equivalent of the face frame of the cabinet. So I turn my saw to 45 degrees, and cut the angle. Now a little bit of glue certainly doesn't hurt on these corners. Just squeeze these together.
Well, it looks like we're getting a few snow flurries out there this morning, but it's not going to bother us in here where we're going to make those raised panel doors. Now, last night before I left the shop, I glued up some cherry boards to make blanks for the raised panels. And over here on the workbench, I have a prototype door, and I want to show you all the parts. There's a couple styles on each side, and then there's a top rail, which is the same width as the style, and a bottom rail, which is traditionally about a half inch wider than the styles. There's a raised panel, raised on the front side, flat on the back. And the way the system works is that you glue the corners together, and the panel just floats. I'll pull it out to show you how it works. The panel actually floats in a groove that's cut in the rails and styles. This one has a nice bead on the face side. Now, I suppose you could cut that bead with your router. You could make the groove with your dado head. But if you're going to build a lot of cabinet doors or cabinets, period, you might think about investing in a shaper, which is nothing more than a real serious router. It comes with a fence, and I've hooked up a vacuum to it to pull all the wood chips away. There's a motor underneath that drives a pulley and, some, and a spindle, which turns at a high rate of speed, about 10,000 RPMs. This is a 3 quarter inch spindle onto which we'll slip our cutters. There's a variety of cutters that you can get. To make our doors, the first cutter we're going to put on is this cutter, which cuts the little cove. It just slips on the shaft. Now, all these cutters that I'm using today are carbide tipped. The second cutter cuts the groove. And the third cutter just cleans the edge along that backside. You notice that all these cutters just fit nice and snug on the spindle. It's a very precise tool. Now a washer. And then this little device, which is a safety guard made out of Lexan. It slips down over the cutter to keep your fingers away from it. I mean, you'd have to really work hard to get in there. Another washer, and then a very important part, this washer, which has a little pin on it that slips down onto the shaft into a groove, keeps the nut from loosening up. And then, of course, the nut. Now, we'll tighten this all down, and we'll be ready to run some pieces through. Okay, now before I run my actual finished pieces through, I've installed this device, which is a safety device. It holds the wood tight to the table surface, and it also holds it up against the rip fence. I also took some time to precisely adjust the fence to get the exact cut that I want, and I ran a scrap through, and it seems to be fine. So now I'm ready to run the finished pieces. As far as I'm concerned, here's reason enough to own a shaper and a set of knives like the one I'm using. Making this cope in the rails, which fits over the styles perfectly. Now, all you have to do to make that cope cut is change the cutters. You leave the fence alone. You leave the height of the spindle alone. You just pull that set off and put on three new ones. Now, I can't really use this hold down setup to do the coping. But I can use this miter gauge, which rides in the slot of the table. And it has an extra bar on it to hold pieces in position, especially these short pieces. And you set the wood in and just clamp it down. Now, I've added a piece of scrap wood behind it. And that's because when you cut end grade, you can get some chip out. And that helps prevent it. Well, that takes care of that end. But when I turn it around to cope this end, I have a problem. No longer is the square edge going to be up against the backer block. I'm going to have a molded edge against it. So I want to change that so I don't get any chip out. And what I did is I took a piece of scrap and ran it through this set of knives so that it has the right configuration. And now I slip that in and run the other ends through.
Now my thickness planer does a real nice job smoothing out those blanks for the raised panels. But once again, I'm going to change my cutter for the next operation. First, I'm going to put a collar on, though. I'll raise the blade up a little bit. Now, the cutter this time is a panel raising cutter. You can see by this profile that's going to cut a tapered panel. It's much bigger in diameter also. It's five inches in diameter. So I've slowed the speed of the shaper down. I'll tighten it on, and we'll run some panels through. That sure does a great job. Hey, okay, now a little bit of yellow carpenter's glue. Just spread out evenly on that coped joint of the rail. It's just a matter of slipping the pieces together, making sure they're even. Put them in a set of clamps to dry for a while. And we'll start working on that base. Now, the base for my cabinet is pretty simple. Just some four-inch cherry that's been mitered at the corners. And I've laid out a cutout here for the toe kick. Now, with it all tri-fitted, I want to do a couple more things. One is to reinforce these corners. And to do that, I'm going to put some biscuits in. So what I have to do is clamp my piece of wood to the workbench. And then I've added this attachment to my biscuit joiner. What it does is it holds the biscuit joiner at an angle like this, flat up against the 45 cut, allowing the saw to go in at 90 degrees. Well, now I think I'll just use my handheld jigsaw to cut out that toe space. Well, my drum sander attachment set up in my drill press does a nice job smoothing out any of the cut. Now I'm ready to assemble it. The only place I'm using any glue is on those corner joints. The rest of the base is held to the cabinet by some screws that are driven from the inside. I want to show you the detail of the front edge of the adjustable shelves. What I did is I took some one-inch stock and I rabbited it out, glued it, and nailed it to the plywood. It covers the edge of the plywood and it adds some strength to the shelf. Now I'll make the rabbit over on my table saw. Now I'm just going to readjust my fence a little bit, raise the blade, and finish making the rabbit. Well, now I'm just rounding over the front edges with a 3 8 inch radius round over bit. Now with the same 3 8 inch router bit, I'm going to round the top edge of my base as well as the corners. Well, as you can see, I've removed my doors from the clamps, and I've sanded the joint smooth because there's one more milling operation that I have to do with the shaper, and that's to make this rabbet and the roundover on the face side of the door. Now, to do that, I use another cutter, and this one is set up to do both operations in one cut. As you can see, this will cut the roundover on the face, and this will cut the rabbet. Now, this happens to be a clockwise rotating bit. So I've switched the motor so that it'll turn in the right direction, and I'll be feeding from left to right rather than right to left. OK, 
say that takes care of hanging the doors. All I used was a semi-concealed casework hinge. And I'm in no hurry to really apply those shelf standards. I'll wait till after the finish is on. But you know, even at this point, I think it looks pretty good. You know, there's a lot of advantages to oiling a piece like this. First of all, the Danish oil finish brings out the natural beauty of the wood. You can really see the grain. And at the same time, it protects it so that it'll resist any staining. Now, it's easy to apply several coats, wiping between each coat. In fact, the more coats you put on, the better it's going to look. Ah, well, that's what I call good television. Hey, what did you expect here in the workshop? The frugal gourmet? Seriously, if you need an entertainment center, I hope that with the help of this videotape and the measured drawing, that you'll build one. Norm Abram is the author of the book, The New Yankee Workshop, which is available in bookstores and libraries nationwide.